Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on what part of the world you are logging in from. And uh, welcome to CMG's webinar on our 2020 release and what's been updated in the last year. Uh, my name is David Hicks. I'm the Vice President of the Eastern Hemisphere. And I'm ably assisted today by Alexis, one of our support staff based in our Dubai office. Uh, for the first little bit of the introduction, I'll leave the webcam, webcam on so you can see me. But once we start the, the main talk, I'll switch it off and let you concentrate on the slides. So I just want to say that uh, this is a, a general technology update for our 2020 release. Uh, it's not an in-depth talk, uh, a very technical talk on all of the different features and how to use them. Uh, we just don't have the time for doing that within the, the one hour time slot we have. There'll be about 40 slides in total. And I'll, uh, in the first five or six slides, I'll provide a general introduction and then I'll jump into uh, a little bit more detail on the release itself. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. I'll switch off my webcam and, and start the talk now. Okay, so CMG's technology update 2020. There are three main things that uh, CMG has been focused on as a, as a sort of general overview of, of where we're going. Yes, there are lots of details on individual areas like EOR, thermal, unconventionals, but overriding all of this are three main areas. Your speed and performance, so everyone wants everything quicker and sooner. Uh, your artificial intelligence, is, this has been a big thing in the last few years of trying to use compute power to assist uh, in making decisions in cloud computing where we can offload some of our IT infrastructure to uh, an external source or we can access large amounts of resources at a very short time frame. So looking at each of these three main areas to start with, um, with regards to speed, uh, I'd just like to say that one size doesn't fit all and you don't want to just pick one technology. So as the English phrase goes, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And there are probably two main approaches to speed is there are what I call the sledgehammers. Um, you're just hitting things with more power, more hardware, so your, your parallel, your MPI, your open MP approaches to parallel, just adding more cores. The idea of vectorization on uh, graphical processing units and coming up with uh, different types of solver technology to try to speed the process up, both linear and nonlinear solvers. And then there are more subtle approaches, such that such thing, things such as load balancing or the concept of work only where you need to work. And the example of this is adaptive implicit. So within our simulators, some of the grid cells are run fully implicitly, some of them are run explicitly. And indeed, many simulators around the world use this sort of AIM method. But we don't question how the simulator selects fully implicit or how it selects explicit grid cells. We just trust in the fact that the technology appropriately uh, selects and we get the best runtime and performance out of our models. And indeed, within CMG, we have our unique DynaGrid capability, which is a, a more visual concept of, of that work where you need to work, where certain parts of the grid are coarsened, other parts are refined, and that adaptively changes over time. So we're continually changing the amount of active grid cells that we're doing calculations on. So within the idea of speed, CMG has certain approaches to the, the sledgehammer approach, and indeed. In our 2020 release, we have MPI versions of both Gen and Star simulators, and it's a, actually a hybrid. It uses Open MP within an individual node and MPI across nodes. And we have run Stars and Gen models at quite happily over a thousand cores on, on large clusters, mainly on uh, the cloud, as CMG doesn't itself want to invest in thousands and thousands of additional cores that we're not going to use on a daily basis. Uh, so in the same way, these sort of things can be easily accessed through the cloud or you can access it through your own HPC clusters. 
And IMAX MPI doesn't currently exist, but it should be coming soon, and hopefully next year in 2021, we'll be able to see IMAX MPI hitting, hitting the streets. The other thing to mention is that we have developed this idea of uh, the combinative uh, solver. This is both combinative AMG and more recently in this particular release, the combinative ILU technology. So these are new solvers in addition to our parasol technology that's existed for many, many years. And we are also working on new solver technology to add to these existing solvers. And there's also uh, the potential for a linear solver or for our geomechanics calculations to be solved on the GPU. So we are looking there, although we're not currently solving anything on the GPU current, uh, at the moment. And then in the more subtle approaches, as I said, the workload balancing uh, is sort of conceptualized in our auto-tune keyword. And it's a simple on-off command. And, for STARS and, and IMEX, it's auto-tune, and in GEM, it's called Adaptive Time Step Control, ADTSC. But it is a simplistic on-off command. You don't have to really think an awful lot about it. And it's based on a statistical analysis of several thousand models uh, to help set up what should be a reasonable numerical set of parameters to start with. It also allows for dynamic solver switching through the run. And we're continually using uh, a sort of proxy model approach, a, a bit of AI built into it to analyze the time steps and to base our, our, our future time steps on the time step size that we've currently seen in the past. So we can adapt our time steps on a much more progressive basis based on how the simulation is actually running at that moment in time. And there are various techniques that have been added into AutoTune to accelerate the convergence of the reservoir simulator while maintaining decent convergence tolerances and appropriate material balance. And both human and artificial intelligence has been applied through this system. CMG's vision on the artificial intelligence side of that is really encapsulated entirely within the CMOS program, although Autotune does capture part of that AI side of things. And CMOS provides this optimization under uncertainty, utilizing both artificial intelligence and the cloud as well as your local systems to essentially accelerate and assist the decision-making process. And indeed, CMOS itself is incorporated into our CoFlow product, which I, I will talk about a little bit later on, but some of you may already be aware of, to provide a complete reservoir engineering plus production engineering optimized solution. So then in the last aspect of this on CMG's vision with regard to the cloud, CMG itself supports both Amazon and Azure systems in both a, a client-managed and a CMG-managed system. So the graphical interfaces could sit on your desktop in your office, and you could be running models in the cloud as a sort of back-end calculation assistance for you. It's all highly secure with a simple drag-and-drop functionality. It's all completely integrated into our CMOS product, or you could run everything on the cloud. So you could run it like a remote desktop environment where you just have your own desktop on the cloud. You have the graphical interfaces there and the data uh, for the graphical interfaces and the data for the, the simulators are all sitting there in the cloud environment. Or you could run on your own cloud environment, so your own HPC type cluster, uh, or you can mix and match however you want. So CMG's idea is to make things available to you and for you to have the opportunity to fit these things around what you're actually doing yourself. And with the 2020 release, um, we've come out with cloud version 2.0. So from 2019 and previous, we had version 1.0. So people migrating to the cloud and CMG's managed service will see quite a lot of differences. And, and particularly on the management side of things for, for IT managers, for uh, management control of the users accessing the cloud systems, you can set up, these are just some screenshots I took from, from the, the manager system. You can set up and manage um, what resources you have, uh, what users are accessing and what resources those individual users have access to on your cloud system. And you have the dashboards and, and graphs showing you what the usage is, how much it's costing you, and the sort of runtime and products being used by the individuals. 
So cloud version 2.0 with 2020 is actually quite a big enhancement for the management side of, of the cloud system. And of course, for the engineers, there's still all the, the great functionality that was there previously. Simply upload your data sets into the cloud. You can see your data sets available for you running on the cloud. Uh, you can manage the jobs you're executing on the cloud. You can see what jobs have succeeded, if there's any problems with any particular jobs, and you can manage uh, the run as it's going along by just monitoring what's happening if you if you so wish, or just wait till the run's completed and then analyze it later. So with our 2020 release, uh, I think we match some general industry trends. We match the speed and performance trend through having multiple approaches, not just one or two approaches, but a whole series of a uh, mixture of sledgehammers and, and subtle approaches through AI. We have the AI side of things through our CMOS product and Autotune, and the cloud computing provides that instant accessibility, power and security for just giving you on demand when you need it, rather than having to worry whether you have the resources or software available in house. So now I'd like to take a closer look at our general release, and it has been out for about one month now. Uh, it was released uh, publicly on our website on the 15th of September. And there are some specific, I suppose, larger encompassing types of developments that I want to talk about. First of all, and this is a three-phase lag hysteresis in GEM, uh, some gravity drainage enhancements across all three of our simulators, hydraulic fracture modeling, across all three simulators, the flux boundary capability across all three simulators. Um, we have a brand new tracer module in both IMX and GEM, and it's now supported in Builder, and it's currently being put into STAR, so that in 2021, you should have this tracer module available to you in STARS as well. And then there's a, a new beta feature, uh, which is available with the 2020 release, and this is the discrete fracture network modeling. So the first of those items, three-phase lag hysteresis. Now, the, what brought this about was people noticing that just like you have a, a grid size dependency on your, your model, so the, the results of your simulations can be dependent on how big or, or small your grid size is, um, the time step size also controls some of the aspects of the recovery in your simulation model, and particularly for WAG processes where you're increasing and decreasing um, the saturations of, of your gas, water, and oil, and you're swapping between capillary pressure curves, both your drainage and inhibition, and generating scanning curves between those two at different points in time in the saturation space. Then essentially, you see a time dependency um, linked to the recovery of your oil. And here, this particular graph is showing you the difference between a 0.1 day time step, a five day time step, and a 30 day time step. Here we have cumulative oil in the y axis and we have time on the x axis. And for this WAG process, you can see there's quite a significant change in the cumulative oil depending on the time step size. So we wanted to remove this time step dependency, and this time step dependency is present in all simulators really. So, how can we get rid of this? Well, I'll point you towards this keyword here in the GEM, GEM simulator. So for the gas phase, we have the G. For the water phase, we have the W. And this essentially allows us to remove this time discretization variation that's caused or seen significantly in WAG processes through the reservoir simulator. So for more details, please refer to this particular keyword. But this is essentially the process it is being aimed at trying to resolve. And then uh, looking at dual media type models and dual permeability models in particular, uh, you have this idea of gas oil gravity drainage, whether you're injecting hydrocarbon gas or whether you're injecting steam. And you might be injecting that into say a, a fractured reservoir where you want the uh, gas to um, allow the oil to drain out of the matrix into the fracture system and drain down the fracture system and pull further down the structure 
so that you can then use horizontal wells further down the structure in order to product, produce the oil that's drained out through the fractures. Now, unfortunately, in the way that dual media models are, are set up, you have the ability to connect matrix to fracture or matrix to matrix. But the matrix to fracture connections is through essentially a sort of sigma calculation or uh, your fracture spacing calculation. And both the depth of the matrix cell and the depth of the fracture cell are at the same depth. So there is no gravity head across that system. There is a gravity head from uh, fracture to fracture and from matrix to matrix, but no gravity head between the matrix and fracture in the system. So what eventually ends up happening is if I look at a system where I have a, a series of layers here, these white layers are essentially nulled out matrix or shale barriers, and those shale barriers are cut by fractures. So essentially the fracture cell is live sitting here, but there is no matrix cell. So in a typical model, we'd have the matrix it can't go into the matrix because the matrix doesn't exist, but the fracture can go into the fracture, but we don't have any gravity effect taking us from the matrix into the fracture system here. It's just whether there's an imbibition type effect occurring, but there's no gravity drainage. So with the trans D keyword being applied to the, the dual permeability model, we have allowed these extra connections, which will when the matrix is missing, we will connect the matrix to the fracture and the fracture will connect back into the, the matrix system. So now we can forget about this type of system here and we can get in a dual media or a dual power model, this type of drainage where we have gas in green, allowing the oil to drain through the system and we can produce from the oil pool at the bottom. So that is a, a nice enhancement if you're looking at gas or gravity drainage processes in the dual permeability model. And that's access through this trans D keyword. Now in the world of hydraulic fractures, uh, we primarily are looking at the, the North American unconventional shale gas, shale oil type production. And so there's a, a large amount of additional functionality that we're not going to go into here in, in a lot of detail, but those of you who want to maybe see a little bit more detail, we do have a Western Hemisphere webinar next week. I'm sure that will go into the hydraulic fracture improvements in a lot more detail since it's, it's quite relevant to that particular part of the world. But just to go through some of the, the, the new parts within um, what we've done in the last year, one of the main things is that we, rather than having or specifying the hydraulic fracture by specifying the number of geological layers up and down, we can now specify the fracture height. So we can say it's 10 meters up and maybe eight meters down, and we will actually fit the fracture, the hydraulic fracture into that upper down vertical scale rather than just fitting it into the, the layer basis that maybe is represented by your geology. The other uh, major aspect um, that's been added is support for um, a brand new format, which we essentially um, describe here. So typically when we're generating a, maybe a large field or sector model for, uh, of hydraulic fractures, the hydraulic fractures may be, of ori may be originally modeled in a product such as Gopher or Stimplan or one of these hydraulic fracture modeling tools. And those tools export in a sort of Excel type format on a well by well basis. Now, if I have a several hundreds of wells and, and many, many thousands of stages, trying to import these wells one by one is absolutely painful. And then these products came up with a new format called GSLib, which allows you to try to export all of this data in sort of one file format, but there's still a lot of information missing from there. So CMG got together with these sort of companies and came up with a new CMG FRAC format. And we've created a DLL that allows these programs to essentially output into that format. And we've distributed it to go for another vendors are, are going to follow and pick up this DLL. So with one button within your hydraulic fracture modeling tool, you'll be able to export into this format. And then you'll be able to one button, just load it all into the builder environment and create those hydraulic fractures automatically for you within the reservoir simulator. And then 
Uh, we've also added, uh, just to capture the uh, injection side of the hydraulic fracture modeling, where you're maybe injecting uh, on a stage-by-stage -stage basis along the horizontal well, and you're doing it, uh, you're recording the, the flow rates into the well where you're doing the fracks on, on maybe a seconds or minutes basis and allowing us to take that information and then adapt it into a more sensible time scale for the reservoir simulator. And then just in general, there's been a whole series of major speed and usability advances just for unconventionals and fracture modeling workflows in general. And so any of you that are doing those types of workflows should see large benefits on, on that side of the of builder and the simulators. So then the next item, major item was flux boundary, and we've been asked for this for a number of years. And so uh, in the last year or so, we've we finally uh, decided that they were going to put it into the simulators. And the, the great thing is it's it's pretty much available across all types of systems that you can create within the reservoir simulators. So it can be used on both dual media grids, so your dual porosity, dual permeabilities, and also with LGRs present in the model. So we don't have to worry that you whether you have LGRs or not, that they won't be uh, they're not exempted. So there we do account for LGRs. And there are two types of boundary. There's essentially a flux boundary where we're actually modeling or capturing the fluxes that are flowing across the grid cell boundary here. And there's a pressure type boundary where instead of capturing the fluxes, we're actually capturing the primary variables of the grid cells that are sitting just inside that boundary. So you have a choice of whether you're going to use a pressure type or, or flux type. And indeed, within Builder 2020, um, we do have interface support for that. So you can just create polygons or re regions of grid cells where you want the boundaries. You would run your, your full field simulation once, and then you could run the simulation again by just essentially running it with the flux boundary and running the small subset of the simulation within there, really just to speed things up. The next major item that's been added to the simulators, and this is just within IMEX and GEM, it's not yet within STARS, uh, although that will be coming soon. Uh, and the support was added in Builder 2020 for this. And just like uh, our geomechanics is a completely separate area within Builder and the simulators, the, the tracer module itself is actually a, a separate section within the reservoir simulators and within Builder itself. And it allows you to, to track essentially molecules around the, the grid. And because we actually uh, do it in an explicit fashion, adding many tracers will have only a minor effect on the runtime. So if you are adding more and more components to say gem or stars, that has quite a significant effect on the runtime. But adding uh, individual new tracers uh, will only have a much, much smaller effect on, on runtime. So you could run with 10 or 20 tracers and it would only add a very small amount to the overall runtime of the reservoir simulators. The other great thing about having it as a sort of separate explicit calculation module within the, the simulators themselves is that we can apply different numerical techniques to the tracer calculation than we're actually applying to the reservoir flow simulation itself. And, and the next slide sort of gives you a, a good example of this. So I'll, it's a bit of a messy slide, but I'll try to do, describe what we're showing here. So here we have distance on the x-axis and we have tracer concentration in the y-axis. And essentially it's just a 1D linear model, um, several hundred grid cells in the x direction, uh, no grid cells in the y, and no grid cells in the z direction. So it's just a 1D piston. And the idea is to look at how numerical dispersion affects this peak tracer profile that we're injecting into the system. Can we preserve that peak as we drive it through the system or does it somehow get dispersed? So using an upwind type technique, we can see that this initial peak over time as we drive it through the system ends up being flattened and dispersed in time. So it essentially gets flattened out. So that what was originally a peak here ends up being reduced and essentially dispersed through the system. And over time, 
as we continue to drive that peak through the system, it gets flatter and more dispersed. So eventually it sort of almost disappears over time. Now, if I use a higher order calculation method like TVD, we can see in this case, our blue peak, as we drive it through the 1D piston, essentially is preserved. And as we continue to drive it through, we still preserve that peakiness. So in that way, if I do have a slug of tracer, I don't have to worry about numerical dispersion, essentially dispersing it out of existence within my model. And really all of the dispersive effects that will be occurring in the simulation model will be just due to jet things like heterogeneity or absorption of the tracer, but we don't have to worry about things such as numerical dispersion. And then uh, the beta feature for 2020, and this is what we call our discrete fracture network modeling, and this essentially allows us to model any linear feature at any 3D angle uh, in its exact representation. So here is what you would classically see as a DFN where we have explicitly defined fracture structures cutting through my, my reservoir system. How do I try to capture that in, in my overall model? Now, we can actually take that type of uh, hydraulic, oh, not hydraulic, sorry, uh, naturally fractured type system and load it in two types of format, a .fab format and a .ts format. And these are typically gold or gold CAD formats. I believe Petrel supports one of these types of formats as well. The simulator can read it in just as an include file, or you can read it into Builder and just include it into the simulation model itself. Or you can manually define these hydraulic, uh, these uh, discrete fracture network systems. And indeed, one of our um, development staff thought it fun to create the CNG logo here through using a whole series of DFNs to look at water flooding through the CNG logo. The other great thing about this is just like with the um, flux boundary method, it also works with LGRs and dual media grids. So I have a, a couple of examples I can show you. Um, we just have a very simplistic cube here where we have a water injector in one corner, a producer in another corner, and we have the DFN sitting through the system here. And what the DFN looks like is this idea of a triangle. We have a linear DFN cutting through diagonally through the system. And we have essentially two linear DFNs connecting up to form this sort of triangle. So we have one pathway through here, another pathway through here, and a diagonal pathway through there. Now, as we flood water into the system, you can actually see how the water is flowing through this DFN towards the producer, and how the actual um, pattern of water isn't now uh, circular around the water injector. We're essentially getting it following the DFN along here and up through the DFN along this cell phase there. So you can see the effect that DFN is having on what would otherwise be a homogeneous type of structure. Indeed, the next example is, is, is an interesting one as well, where we have the similar structure, but we have some water in the bottom, and we have essentially a gap between the grids. So the grids are, are physically separated. There is no connection between these grids apart from the DFN that you can see hopefully there. And in, in a cross section, you can see these are the two DFNs that are sitting here. We have a production and injection well. We're injecting water in the bottom perforations, as you can see here, and we're producing from the upper perforations. And as we progress through time, we're injecting water, and the water itself can only enter the upper grid through these DFNs or these linear pathways. So DFNs can be representing many sorts of things. It could just represent a DFN, a discrete fracture network. It could represent a transmitting fault, or it could represent some form of hydraulic fracture or pathway through your reservoir grid. You can define it however you like. Okay, so then there's a whole series of other developments uh, besides those major ones. And these are Polymer and IMEX. We've been enhancing the capabilities of IMEX over the last couple of years. We've also got a simplified geomechanics in IMEX. Uh, we have rate dependent absorption. We've been doing a bunch of work on Flexwell. Uh, we have an interesting addition to group control in, with aquifers for all the simulators. Uh, there have been some trigger additions for all the simulators. 
and we've added direct reading of Eclipse format models to our IMEX reservoir simulator. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And we've essentially added a whole bunch of new stuff in results. And I'll, I'll briefly mention, as I, as I said earlier, we'll briefly talk about code flow later on. So looking again at these one by one, this table is actually quite a nice summary of physical polymer type of polymer physical effects in the reservoir and which simulator IMAX, STARS or GEM captures those physical effects. Now you can see IMAX doesn't really capture thermal effects because IMAX isn't a thermal simulator, it's an isothermal simulator and it doesn't really capture chemical effects because essentially it's a black hole simulator and not a multi-component simulator. But it captures most of the other general effects you'd be seeing within the polymer environment. And so since our 2018 release, IMAX has allowed up to six components in its system. And it's essentially not just an oil, water, gas reservoir simulator plus one other. It's now an oil, water, gas plus API tracking plus salinity plus polymer, which allows us to do such things as adding in salinity dependency of polymer into the IMAX black hole simulator. It also allows us to add things like polymer absorption as a RELPERM interpolator within our black hole simulator. So we have the ability to do RELPERM interpolation, and one of the RELPERM interpolants is this polymer absorption. And that was added in 2019. And in 2020, we've added the ability to model polymer degradation on a mechanical basis, really, because as I said, we cannot really model chemical or thermal polymer degradation because it's not a chemical or thermal simulator. And we've added some new outputs, and Builder itself has a new polymer wizard for IMEX. So previously it had a polymer wizard for both GEM and STARS. Now there is actually an IMEX choice on the, on the wizards for, for that polymer system. And for those of you who have been using polymer and IMEX for the last year or so, I just want to give you this sort of note that between the 2018 and 2019 releases, we did change the way the absorbed polymer was referenced. Instead of referencing it to a pore volume, we were referencing it to a rock volume. And we have a keyword here, uh, polymer absorption reference. If you put it to minus one, it will return you to the pre-2019 approach if you want to recreate or if you built your model around this type of pore volume approach rather than rock volume. And then the other addition to IMEX is what I'd like to call super fast geomechanics. So you no longer have to run full 3D finite element geomechanics, but you capture the effect of that full 3D finite geomechanics in a, in a simpler geomechanical basis. So in the past, you had the choice of um, relating geomechanics properties to uh, pressure changes in your reservoir simulation environment. So your porosity and permeability changes could be linked to the changes in pressure. But we know that um, permeability changes in particular are not just really pressure controlled, they're stress controlled. So stress has a big effect on the permeability and not really pressure. So how can we capture stress within the reservoir simulator without having to go to a full 3D finite element geomechanical calculation. And so we sort of did this through this concept of mean total stress. And it really just effectively adds one additional variable to the simulator to calculate, meaning that it's not that expensive when you actually add it into the reservoir simulator, but it does allow you to now start to base your rock mechanical properties on stress and your permeability changes. And particularly when you're looking at hydraulic fractures and the stress changes induced by those, then the permeability effects really should be linked to stress and not just due to pressure changes. And these are these sort of capability is accessed through this rock tab S and through these MTS or mean total stress keywords, where you can supply Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, and some variables to basically define a simplistic geomechanics calculation. And then another thing to mention is that when, if you are looking at full 3D geomechanics uh, within Builder, there's been additional assistance added to, to building those sorts of models. Okay, so 
on the solver side of things, so in my, my introductory talk, I, I, I mentioned the fact that there are these sledgehammers, there's a, the sort of parallel approaches uh, through CPUs, GPUs, and there's this sort of approach that you can take through changing your solvers. And indeed, CMG has added in 2020 this new commutative ILU solver. And we previously had this commutative AMG solver and for many, many years, the parasol solver. But there was a sort of gray area in between those. So commutative works very well in, in large grid systems with very high numbers of linear iterations. And parasol works well in small to medium sized grid systems with low numbers of linear iterations. But there's a sort of gray area in between those two, which this commutative ILU solver actually sort of helps uh, solve much more quickly. The great thing is that um, Autotune, particularly within IMEX, will automatically switch based on observed simulator performance. So even if you don't start off with using one of these, the simulator itself will try to flip to one of these solvers if you have Autotune uh, applied in order to try to speed up the simulator by applying one of those new solver techniques. Of course, you can manually just put these things in, and sometimes manually changing the solver gives you an even better runtime. But just to let you know that Autotune can pick these things up manually. And indeed, uh, we have a new solver for the geomechanics, this preconditioned uh, gradient linear solver, PCG. Doesn't really affect the, the runtime a huge amount, but it drastically reduces the amount of RAM or the amount of memory that the geomechanics takes. So if you find you're trying to run a large 3D geomechanical model and you're running out of RAM, then using the PCG solver may allow you to run it in, in much smaller uh, RAM footprint. And we're actually currently looking at some other approaches. So as well as that mean total stress approach we added into to IMEX, uh, we're now looking at this, what they call the displacement discontinuity method to essentially provide a, a new step forward in performance for, for full geomechanical calculations. So this hopefully maybe in 2021, we'll start to see the results of that DDM approach into the geomechanics side of things. And then with the 2020 release, we've provided full Dynagrid access in IMEX. So for processes where Dynagrid is applicable, you might be able to get some quite interesting speed ups as you adaptively course and or adaptively refine the grid over time through the IMEX simulator. Previously, uh, you just had access to either coarsening or LGR in a static form, but this provides the full dynamic triggering capability. And then maybe a, a small one, but for those of you that are into um, modeling core floods and scaling up the, the chemical core floods to full fields, this is quite an interesting development that was added into STARS in our 2020 general release. Unfortunately, it didn't make the GEM 2020 general release, but it is in a, in a release that came after that, which we got as 2021. Uh, so if people need access to this rate dependent absorption in GEM, you can get access to it by asking for this updated version of GEM. And essentially it allows us to uh, more better understand uh, absorption effects at the core scale and how they relate to absorption effects at the field scale. So absorption itself, um, without this rate dependent effect is essentially an instantaneous equilibrium. Things move into a grid cell and they're absorbed or they're not, depending on the conditions in that grid cell. Now, what you actually apply here is a rate dependency because you know that in the lab, a lab test on a core plug might be one day, two days uh, experimental time. And absorption itself isn't an instantaneous process. It may occur over several hours. And so in order to get a, a better instantaneous absorption value, you need this sort of rate dependent effect within the simulator as being modeled as part of the core scale environment. So we can get a better match at the core scale by applying this rate dependent effect. We can thus get a better equilibrium absorption value, which then we can take to the full field rather than trying to approximate the absorption value that we might have been seeing in the core and not actually matching up so well. So this rate dependent absorption is really very, very useful for 
um, core floods of, of chemical type processes. And then on the, the star side of things, we've been doing quite a lot on the, the flex well model in stars. Uh, and this is this idea of this no slip model. And essentially, um, this no slip model, the aim is to provide both stability and improved runtime. And you can see this is a SAG D well with flow control devices and a heterogeneous reservoir and a fractured system. We do get a significant runtime improvement going from 39 hours to 29 hours. And essentially, the results are pretty much the same. Uh, yes, there is a little bit of deviation, but we're looking at a transient process here. So we're expected not to get exactly the curves on top of each other. But the overall result is pretty much exactly the same. Even better, going from 12 hours to just over one hour. And this here, we're looking at undulating horizontal well with essentially a, an annular um, um, tubing system, heterogeneous with dilation effects in the reservoir. In previous versions of STARS without the no slip model, we get very unstable results here. We get quite a lot of oscillation in the blue. Uh, in the sort of browny orange color, we can see with the no slip model, we do get a lot more stability. And that stability pretty much follows the previous result, but we get it in a much faster way. And indeed, there's some cases, in this case, it was a supercritical CO2 injection in Flexwell. We couldn't even run it using Flexwell previously, but now with the no slip model, we actually run it in quite a, a reasonable time frame, 17 minutes here. So some models that wouldn't actually run previously will actually now run quite happily in STARS Flexwell. So then jumping back to something that's applicable to all of the simulators, and this is this group control with aquifer influx, and it's accessed through this keyword G called aquifer, and it only really influences voidage replacement or pressure maintenance type controls. And if you think back about what voidage replacement and pressure maintenance are doing, essentially you have a series of wells attached to a group. Some of them are producers and some of them are injectors. And when I'm doing, say, a voidage replacement, whatever amount of volume comes out of the producer is re-injected down the injector. So if I produce 100 barrels a day reservoir volume, I will be injecting 100 barrels a day reservoir volume. However, if I have an analytical aquifer that's attached to the boundary of my model, that's not taken account of because it doesn't know anything about it. It's just looking at what's produced and then deciding what I need to inject. So with this new keyword, <clears throat> where we have analytical aquifers attached to the system, they will now be accounted for in our voidage replacement or pressure maintenance type controls. The other thing to mention with regards to aquifer is that even if you weren't familiar with our 2019 release, we actually added a couple of different types of aquifer models, the flux and pressure boundary aquifers, through the aquamethic keyword were added last year and are still present in the simulator this year. So wherever you have an analytical aquifer combined with these sorts of pressure maintenance, you may want to take a look at this GCON aquifer type keyword. And then a whole series of what I call miscellaneous developments, triggers. We've output or we've created a whole bunch of new trigger stuff in 2019 and added to it again in 2020. So you can now have much more compli complex if else if and else type structures. We added the equals and greater than or equals or less than or equals operators. And you can turn triggers on and off at any time you want in recurrent data. The other thing that we've had um, that essentially I would, well, I'm stealing the words from one of our developers. He calls it the ultimate trigger control for wells is that we have created a general Python class but if people want to see how that uh, looks and want to develop their own Python scripts, we can provide them some examples of this. And it essentially allows a simple user scripting via Python to control our outboard functionality. So outboard is something we've had for, for many, many years in our simulators. And indeed, that's how we connect to external products like surface network simulators, or we've connected up to external products like geomechanics simulators. Um, but in some respects, outboard can be just run by any external program. So you could just write 
a little script in whatever language you want and use outboard to have that script control the reservoir simulator, how it's performing over time or what it's doing. Um, but since most university courses are now teaching students how to script in Python, it seems to be a very popular language. We've provided this class now for people who want to script in Python. They can now, instead of using things like triggers, they can use outboard to control the simulator in any way that they want to, um, that's accessible through this outboard linkage. Another thing that's got a very small item in here is that we've we've been running Eclipse data sets for, for a number of years. We've had the Eclipse uh, 100 converter that's been accessible to people or we've done the conversions ourselves in-house. And now we've got to such a stage that pretty much most of the models, Eclipse models we're running, we just run in the converter or we can just run directly within the simulator without having to worry about any changes or, or any keywords not being supported. So on that basis, our 2020 release has allowed you to just simply drag and drop Eclipse datasets onto the IMAX icon, and it will do a, an internal conversion and submit the, 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 the simulator run to the IMAX simulator. Or you can essentially drag and drop an Eclipse dataset into Builder, and you can see what the, the dataset looks like in Builder, and you can modify it, change it, add it, uh, convert it into stars, whatever you want to do with it, um, and then save it as IMAX gem or stars and run the data set that way yourself. So we have the ability to either simply drag and draw, drop onto IMAX or drag and drop onto Builder uh, for Eclipse format type models for the 2020 release. Um, just as I mentioned, we'd added the um, absorption rate dependency in a, in a subsequent version of gem called 2021. Uh, we've added a new item in IMAX called 2021. So there's actually an update of IMAX, even just one month after the release, we've been adding some new features. And this is to account for changes in relative permeability over time due to continuous water flow. And essentially what's happening as, as you flood your reservoir over time, um, some things might dissolve, some, some things might move around, the actual pore structure of the reservoir is, is potentially changing over time due to that large amount of water fluxing through the system. Now, within GEM and STARS, you can model those physical processes directly and understand how those physical processes are working. But if you just want to capture it very simplistically in a black hole simulator for speed, you can now do this because we've applied this new interpolant that basically just looks at how much water is fluxing through a grid cell and allows you to change the relative permeability based on that water flow. And then something to speed up uh, data loading for very, very large uh, grid sets uh, or uh, data sets is that we've added what we call our compression. We have this uh, idea of, uh, in the last few years, we've moved from an SR2 to an SR3 data structure. And SR3, one of the great things about the SR3 structure is it's a much compressed data structure. So instead of having, say, a 30 gigabyte, gigabyte output SR2 file, you now maybe have a 5 or a 10 gigabyte SR3 file. And when you're dealing with very large models uh, and you're trying to load the model or analyze the model, then the bigger the space it takes up in your disks, the longer it's going to take to read. And some of these models, um, it's actually the disk reading that's, that's causing some of the delays in them being processed. So if we can reduce the, the footprint of that model on your hard drive, we can actually uh, increase the load time, or I should say decrease the load time to make it load quicker. And we can take up a lot less uh, disk space on, on your systems. So SR3 has been around for output for a few years now, but we've now taken that and put it as an input structure. So in Builder, you can actually save in a sort of SIP compressed format. So things like your cord and Z corn arrays, maybe your porosity or permeability arrays, things that you're not going to manually want to edit in a, in a keyword type format, but only through an interface, um, would be compressed and put into the structure. So you might find that what was a two or 300 megabyte input file now 
dropped down to maybe four or five megabytes because most of the large data arrays have been compressed and stuck in this sort of binary format. And then some, I suppose, truly miscellaneous developments. For high salinity brines, we added the Pitzer activity model for those of you that are looking at CO2 dissolution into, into uh, the water phase. And we've also added streamlines into our results program. So, so this has been a feature that, that people have been looking for for a while. Uh, we've been enhancing that streamline capability in, in results over the last year. The other neat thing um, that you'll probably see if you're using our launcher on your desktop in Launcher 2020 is you have this progress bar. So when you have your data sets all sitting here in Launcher, you've submitted them to your local computer, uh, you've submitted them to some queue somewhere, you can actually see how that data set is progressing. So you don't have to open it up, you can just say, okay, my run's now gone 70% of the way through. So it's a bit like when you see in Windows when it's loading something, you have the revolving circle and it says, uh, I'm 50% through installing this program or loading it. You've got this similar type of approach here that gives you a quick look at how far your, your data sets have progressed in your runs. Now I sort of want to talk a little bit more about results and start to finish up my talk here. Um, results itself is a post-processing product we've been issuing on a quarterly or three-month basis. So although we've had one major release every year, so the 2020 release or the 2019 release, um, after our 2019 release, we've had a, a 1920, a 1930 uh, version of results. And we would have had, a, I think we may have had a 1940 even, or we would have, but we, we were preparing for the 2020 release. So pretty much uh, results has been coming out on a, a three-month basis uh, with new additions to that product. And we're taking the same approach in Builder because we want to get the new uh, features out there rapidly to our user bases. And we want feedback on, on how those new new features are actually working. So maybe we need to change some of those features to make them more usable for, for the, the engineers themselves. So we're now uh, moving to a quarter release of both of these products and, and results and builder should have a new update released sometime in November with some new features added. But for um, Results itself in 2020, some of the, the bigger features are histograms. So we now have the ability, whenever we're displaying anything in 3D, we can generate the histogram of the property we're showing here. So here we're showing pressure. We're showing the distribution of pressure through the grid system itself here. And as we slice and dice the grid, or as we chop it up or remove parts or, or put cross sections through it, as we animate over time, that histogram will automatically update to whatever is being displayed in your, your 3D screen here. As well as uh, streamlines, we've added flow vectors as an additional analysis tool. So you can generate these little uh, arrow plots showing you how things are flowing around in your grid. And a really, really useful item that used to be in our uh, results 3D program. Um, is now in our new results program, and this is well bubble plots. So now you can get pie charts of your of your well production, and you can see oil, water, gas production. Uh, the magnitude of the bubble tells you how much is being produced here. You can get difference bubbles. You can show any property you want in, in a bubble type uh, plot, and you can also view these as cylinders in the 3D type of plots. And then another useful item that's been added to results 2020 is ability to see wells through all layers. So if I look at a, 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 a plot of a particular layer uh, in my, my reservoir model, I would typically only see the perforations that were present within that layer. And if the well was horizontal or deviated through multiple layers, I wouldn't have an idea of exactly where that, that deviated or horizontal well was going. Now I can just see, uh, I just select the option and I can see how those wells appear. And essentially all of the perforations are collapsed onto the, the particular layer that I'm looking at at that point in time. And I can see the X, Y uh, display where that well is going in X, Y space. 
And then a useful thing if you're trying to export to a G&G package, so say I want to output my oil saturations or my pressures to um, GoCAD or Petrel or some other G&G type package, I can now click on the export rescue button and import rescue into that particular G&G package. Or indeed, I could export in ResQML format as well. So we've got the choice of ResQML or Rescue, depending on what formats those particular G&G packages support. And then through the, the 19 release cycle, we added in results ability to put in ad hoc groups. So even if you didn't create the group control structure in your simulation data set, later on you can combine wells in any way you want to generate custom plots of, of groups of wells. And additionally, in 2020, we've added this general preferences tabs. So now if you like to see things in a certain way when you start off, as an individual user, you can start to set some of those uh, systems. Even if you don't have a template to start with, you can just, if you're starting from scratch, just say, this is how I like to see my grid. And we'll continue to add to this sort of preferences template as we go through with later releases. And then finally, uh, it's not really an update on, on CoFlow itself. It's really just to describe to you what CoFlow is. So some of you may know a little bit about CoFlow and some of you may never have really heard about it. So there's no, not much point in actually giving you an update of what's new in CoFlow. Uh, it's better just to describe roughly what CoFlow is. And if you're interested, you can always contact one of the CMG people to find out a bit more. But essentially, trying to capture it in, in one slide, uh, CoFlow is something we've been developing with Shell over many, many years, and Petrobras was part of that for a while. And it's essentially a complete, it, complete integrated production and systems management system from all the way from your reservoir uh, to the facility. So you could be looking at your reservoir simulation model all the way to the delivery point in an FPSO and all the pipes tools, hardware, uh, everything that's in between. Now, uh, one of the, the major changes in the approach that CoFlow takes as opposed to what typical reservoir simulation models type uh, typically take is it's all built on a database. So there's no such thing as keyword files anymore. It's purely, I have the data, I generate a workflow, and then I submit it for calculation. And somebody else could use that calculated information to then do further calculations. But everything is based on the underlying data and everything's written back into that database. So you can have multiple users all seeing that data. And indeed, there's a whole version control, data sharing, audit trail capability that's built into this databasing and interface environment. So you can have multiple users all accessing the data in different ways at different times. So maybe your PVT expert is building a PVT model, your production engineer is building a, a model of the, the well that's going to go into your reservoir simulation. And all of those people can be interacting at the same time through the same interface with that data in your database. The other concept is this multi-fidelity concept where my production engineer may start off with IPR curves to determine how to uh, best optimize his production network, or he may decide he wants to use a tank model, a material balance model, which is part of CoFlow, or he may want to attach in a full discretized reservoir simulation model, and he can choose what he wants to add in at whatever point in time and swap backwards and forwards between those things as and when he wants to take account of it. And then, as I said, it's just one interface, so everyone sees the same interface, everyone's interacting in the same environment, and everyone's interacting in the same data. And for those of you that are interested, uh, our latest paper on this is SP203151, and it's going to be presented at ADEPEC in Abu Dhabi on the 12th of November, and it's on a 9.30 slot in uh, Abu Dhabi time. So I've used up my hour. Um, I just want to summarize uh, and say there's a lot going on at CMG and there's way too much to fit into one talk. And 
For any of you who have questions, you feel free to add in the question or the chat box and Alexis will be answering. If we don't answer it now, we can follow up and answer your questions later. If you do want to maybe uh, ask questions uh, later on, once the, the uh, webinar is, is, is finished, you can always send it to our support email or even to our sales email or individuals directly. Um, we've been around for over 40 years now. Um, so CMG has been innovating and adding to our software every year for the last 43 years, in fact. And the great thing is that our very first employee at CMG, Long Yim, his photograph is up here, is still at CMG and he's our chief technology officer. So he masterminds all of our R&D program and he works with the development group to produce all of this great stuff that you get year after year within our products. And so finally, if you're interested in seeing some more information, then all of this is publicly available. We have our own YouTube channel uh, that's got some short how-to videos and some short uh, videos showing you certain things within the CMG environment. But we've also been doing a whole series of online training that you should see announcements in LinkedIn and, and on our website. You can join those online trainings or you can actually browse through the previous online training and download the actual um, course material that was linked to it and, and go through some of that training material yourself. So I'd like to say at this point, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the one hour that you've given to us. And um, if you'd like to see a slightly different version of this What's New in a different time zone, uh, next week we have a, a similar discussion in our, our Western Hemisphere that may have a, a slightly different emphasis than this year. So thank you for your time um, and I uh, hope to see you in the future, maybe in 2021 in person when we get back to some, some normal operations.